to the great big mess that it's in. And the world is in a mess. I think that one of the most uncontroversial beliefs that Christians affirm is that the world that we live in is broken. You don't have to look very long or hard to see evidence of this. And while the understanding that the world is broken is a pretty universal understanding, what's not so universal is the understanding of the reason for why it's broken. You know, that kind of thing is often a topic of debate. There are many who would look at the socioeconomic factors of a person's life, you know, their family, home life, what kind of security they have in food, shelter, clothing, that kind of thing. And those things are important. Uh, I think if any of us had, didn't have some of those things, we would be possibly different people as well. Uh, but those of us who believe that the Bible is the word of God and that the Bible gives us the true story of humanity and the world, we believe that the brokenness that we see in the world today also has roots that go deeper than just the outside, factor in people's, the outside factors in people's lives, as important as those things are. When we read the Bible, we see that the problem began in the events that we read about way back in Genesis 3. And those events are what we are going to be looking at today. Now, Genesis 3, as we probably know, tells the story of how Adam and Eve gave into the temptation of the serpent and disobeyed the explicit commands of God. This, this disobedience plunged humanity into separation from God and put us on the path to inevitable death. And it's a path that we cannot get ourselves out of because it's a path that we all choose because we all choose to sin in one way or another and sin leads to death. But the story we're looking at today is the story of the first sin, the first moment in history where suddenly everything that comes after it is changed forever. The story where the fate of our species was decided, where our greatest of great-grandparents decided to throw their lot and the lot of everyone following us in with the fate of the cursed serpent. But as terrible as this moment is, it is not without hope. Because God always knew that this moment was coming. He knew that it was coming. And when it did, a plan was set in motion that God had in mind from the time he was speaking the world into being. A plan that would undo the pain and devastation brought about by the actions of the serpent and the compliance of the humans. And for those who put their faith and trust in the one who crushes the serpent, God's plan will restore them to their maker and they will once again be known as children of God. Let's turn now to Genesis chapter 3. I'll be reading from verses 1 to verse 19. But the passage that we will be focusing the most closely on today is verses 14 and 15, which is on the insert in your bulletin. And I'll be reading from the NIV. So Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman... Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he wa was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some of the fruit of the tree, and I ate it. The Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you 
above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will make your pains in child re- childbearing very severe. With painful labor you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from, from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of, by the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since, it's, since from it you were, you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. We've all felt the effects of sin in our lives. Nobody is immune to the brokenness in the world. And as we've just seen, the reason for this is because right as we as a species got going, right as we were just about to just do our thing, we took a turn down a path that we were never supposed to go. But we didn't go down that, we didn't go down that path alone, did we? Leading the charge down the path was the one who, in, who was introduced in this story as the serpent. He was, he, and he was bent on causing the downfall of humanity. Now, those of us who grew up in Christianity are probably familiar with this character, the serpent. Uh, and how the Bible later on calls him Satan, and how he is viewed as being the one who's actually behind the serpent in the story. You know, the story isn't about just any old snake, and that's pretty obvious. I don't know of any tradition or biblical passage that tracks the journey of a simple snake as it develops a vendetta against humans and then plans on carrying it out against them in some elaborate plot. No, we're not talking about a vindictive snake here. That's, there's obviously more to it than that. So, For our purposes today, though, it is is enough to view this character as the same one who tempted Jesus in the wilderness and who will eventually be thrown in the lake of fire at the end of all things in Revelation. And in this story, for this serpent's evil purposes, he appears in the form of a serpent. And just as snakes today lay eggs and lie on them, the serpent from this story has been sitting on a plot that is ready to hatch. And it wants, to, it wants to be rid of humanity, and it would be all the sweeter if it could force God's hand to do the job himself. Because the only thing that this creature hates more than humans is God and God's love for humans. And he can't be rid of God. God is eternal and everlasting. He can't get rid of God. There's no getting rid of God. But he can, so it appears by the rules that God set up, be rid of humans and grieve God at the same time. This was the plot. God set up a choice that the humans had to make every day. Every day, they had to choose whether or not they were going to obey God's instructions and not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is set up in the previous chapter, and you're probably familiar with that story. When God created the world, he planted a garden, and he called it Eden. In and amongst it, he planted an orchard of fruit-bearing trees, all of which were good for food, except he planted two special trees. One was the tree of life, and one was the knowledge of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And God specifically commanded Adam, and this was before Eve was even made, that he is not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Anyone who did would die. And here is where the enemy found a legal loophole that would trick humanity into guilt before God and seal their fate of death. So the enemy did what he does best. He acted shrewdly. That's what the text says he was. He was shrewd. He was crafty. We just read how he did this better than any other of God's non-human creatures. He was more crafty and shrewd than any of the wild animals of the field. And on the surface, these are not necessarily bad characteristics. Indeed, the ability to be crafty and clever are characteristics given to the serpent by God since the serpent was a created being. The serpent didn't create itself. God created it. And in, Proverbs, in the book of Proverbs... One, chapter 1, verses 1 to 7, we read, The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, to learn wisdom and moral instruction, to discern wise counsel, to receive moral instruction and skillful living with righteousness, justice, and equity, 
to impart shrewdness to the morally naive, a discerning plan to the young person. Let the wise also hear and gain instruction. Let the discerning acquire guidance. To discern the meaning of a proverb and a parable, the sayings of the wise and their riddles. Fearing the Lord is the beginning of discernment, but fools have despised wisdom and moral instruction. So being able to be shrewd and crafty is actually a God-given ability. But in that ability, God planted a dependency. And that dependency required that we stay in a place of fearing, that is, honoring and respecting and deferring to the Lord. And that is exactly what the serpent didn't do. He didn't fear the Lord. He didn't show the Lord proper honor and respect. He didn't care to try to understand God's purposes for the way the world is ordered and structured and humanity's place in it. And in his headlong pursuit of being rid of Adam and Eve, he proved himself to be a fool because the plot he hatched turned back on him and led to his own downfall because God is about to bring the hammer down. Anyone who has kids knows that the process of disciplining and figuring out who did what and who said what and who's in the wrong know that sometimes it's complicated to figure out who needs to be punished, but sometimes it's not complicated at all. It's just time for punishment. And that's what we see in the story. You know, with, with Adam and Eve, God asks questions, and God hears what Adam and Eve have to say for themselves. But when he gets to the serpent, there are no questions. There is only a curse. There is only punishment. There is no need to explain the situation. The situation explains itself. There is no grace. There is only irrevocable condemnation. The serpent, in its quest for satisfying its hate, sealed its fate. Its pride was its downfall. And its punishment was to crawl around on the newly cursed ground that is now full of thorns and thistles and dust. But it's not just the serpent who is banished to the ground. Adam, too, is doomed to return to the place where he came from. He came from the dust, and to the dust he will return. Because Adam chose to follow the way of the serpent and break the explicit commands of the Lord. And he now lives in a new reality where his fate and the fate of the serpent are forever joined. They now live in a world where the destiny of humanity is to return to the dust and the punishment of the serpent is to eat the dust. And this is a disturbing image. I haven't tried to sugarcoat the reality of what's going on here. The story as it's told in Genesis 3 paints a horrific image of Adam being doomed to one day return to being dust once again and the deceiver who hates him so much can one day consume the dust that was once Adam. That's the story as it's painted here. That's the image given. And I'm aware of how disturbing this is, and it's understandable to wonder why would God declare that such a thing should happen? Wasn't there another option? But what other option? You know, God's rules are his rules. He made the world. He set it up as it is. And, at, and at the way God set it up, Adam and Eve must die because they broke God's rules. That's how it was set up. But what about the serpent? Why couldn't God just, you know, like just kill the serpent, be done away with it, and pretend like this whole thing never happened? Well, because God never said he would do that. He never, that was never a part of what God said he would do. Up to this point, human beings are the only ones who have the borders and boundaries around what they can and can't do. And there was nothing human about this serpent creature. So the rules about death, about the death of humanity didn't apply to him. But you might also wonder, you know, why didn't God, why did God, like, why did God join the fates of humanity and the serpent together like that? But, you know, it wasn't God who joined them together the first time, was it? They did that themselves. Adam and Eve are the ones who chose to listen to the serpent when they knew God had said otherwise. That was their choice. They chose to be joined with him. God simply gave them what they wanted. This is what sin does. This is how serious sin is. And this is the sin that sent Jesus to the cross. There was no easier way. God didn't take on our humanity in Jesus and suffer and die on the cross when all the while there was an easier way to take care of this problem. There was no other solution. There was no easier way for Jesus to undo what Adam and Eve did 
did than through going to the cross. Only through the cross could such a terrible situation like this be undone. That is how serious the mess that Adam and Eve are in. And they can't take it back. Their eyes have been opened to their nakedness and sin. They can't take that back. They can't go back to where they were before. There's only going forward. Because, as hopeless as the situation is, there is a way forward. God will not let the serpent have the last say. God alone has the right to decide the final fate of humanity. That's God's call. That is God's domain. And in the process of banishing the serpent to the ground, God also promises to raise up someone who can come and deal with the problem that Adam and Eve got themselves into. That will happen, but what God is silent about is when that will happen. And the story that goes on to unfold through the rest of the Old Testament has at its core the ongoing struggle between the people who are loyal and faithful to God and the people who are loyal and faithful to the serpent. And the violence and hatred that is exchanged between these two camps. Just off the bat, think of Adam and Eve's first children, Cain and Abel. God looked favorably on Abel's offering, but not Cain's. Cain hates Abel for it and kills him. And on we go. Adam and Eve have another son, Seth. And through Seth's line, there come many God-fearing people all the way to Noah. Or think of Abraham and Sarah. You know, at first, the plan to raise up an offspring that will crush the head of the serpent seems to have stalled with Abraham and Sarah. You know, they are very, very old. They can't have children. But still, God makes it happen. You know, he's, bring, he's fulfilling his promise to keep the offspring going. Think of the Israelites in Egypt. Think of the Israelites under orders to kill all their boys. Or think of Ruth. You know, the line of Jesus goes through Ruth, but there was a time when she was a widow from a foreign country who was really only interested in taking care of her mother-in-law. God in his graciousness worked through all these situations, even though to our eyes these situations seemed impossible, in order to bring the line of the promised serpent crusher all the way to Jesus. And this might give you a better understanding of, as to why the genealogies of the Bible were so important. Uh, when we get to the Gospel of Luke, later on in the wintertime, Jesus' own genealogy will be traced all the way through these biblical characters, through Seth, through Adam, all the way to God. And you know, biblical writers didn't take the time to record all these generations of names just to fill out a page or to bump up their word count. It's not like they were working on their homework assignments and they just wanted some extra space to make it look good. They meticulously recorded these generations because they had Genesis 3 on their minds. Genesis 3 is God's first promise regarding his plan for how he's going to break the hold that the serpent has on humanity and bring humanity back to himself. All other parts of the plan hinge on his promise to raise up an offspring from Adam and Eve. And as the Old Testament carries on, Part of the work being done in writing it is to trace the line of offspring from generation to generation to generation so that we can know that God was faithful in keeping his promise. And once we do get to Jesus, it's not like things suddenly change. The promise of God to bring a Savior, uh, in the promise of God to bring a Savior, there is the assumption that the act of saving will include a confrontation, uh, an injury, and a death. When we get to Luke, we'll see that right at the beginning of Jesus' time in ministry, he endured a time of testing and temptation, just like Adam and Eve did. But unlike Adam and Eve, when the enemy questioned the words of God, are you really God's son? Jesus stuck to the words of God. When the enemy tempted Jesus to eat, you know, turn these stones to bread, Jesus ate nothing, even though he hadn't had anything to eat for 40 days. When the enemy tempts Jesus with glory and power and affirmation, says, I will give you these nations if you just worship me. Jesus defers everything to God alone. Where Adam and Eve failed, Jesus prevailed. The question can be asked then, what should Adam and Eve have done instead of giving in to temptation? What, what other option did they have? And I think Jesus gives us the answer. Because the difference between what Jesus did and what Adam and Eve did is Jesus submitted his entire existence to the plan and authority of God. And that really is where the breakdown occurred for Adam and Eve. They grasped some of the, some of the authority over their existence for themselves. They knew what God wanted. They knew what God wanted. In fact, Eve seems to have gone above and beyond what God said he wanted them to do. 
However, when the legitimacy of God's instructions is questioned by the serpent, they cave in right away. And what does Jesus do? What did he do when he himself was at his lowest point, when he was in the garden and about to be arrested and the weight of his burden seemed too great for him? He puts himself in a position of trusting God alone. And I know that people are often confused by this part of Jesus' story. It's, uh, he's displaying an unexpected uh, doubt in his mind, but he's not doubting God. He's doubting himself. He's come to the end of himself in this moment, and he can't see how he can endure what he knows is coming. But he does not doubt God and his plan. Instead, he tr- and instead of trusting and acting on his wisdom, Jesus' wisdom, he says, no, not my will, but your will be done. He submits himself to God's wisdom. And in this act of perfect submission, Jesus does what Adam and Eve failed to do. He trusted God, and he did not lean on his own understanding. So how about us? Can we say that this is what we do? Not always. If we're honest, many times we are far closer to Adam and Eve than we are to Jesus. And notice how the contrast is heightened by the circumstances in which Adam and Eve fail and Jesus succeeds. Now, Jesus remains submissive to the Father even at his lowest point. And his lowest point is the lowest point any human has ever gone. You know, we all have bad days. And some of us have been to the deepest depths of grief where we don't even know how we're ever going to get out. And I just want to say that Jesus has been there too. And he's able to meet you there. And there is no depth of human suffering that Jesus is unfamiliar with. He's familiar with it all. And he alone knows the path that takes you to healing because he is the one who first forged it for you, for you to then come and follow him. This is what we get when we place ourselves in the care of and under the authority of the one who loves us so much that he designed and carried out a plan that culminated in his own suffering and death. All for our sake. That's how much he loves you. If we go the way of Adam and Eve and follow the path of the serpent, whatever glory or knowledge or wisdom or notoriety we think we're going to get will one day be dust, and so will we. we didn't, they didn't know grief or pain or suffering. Adam and Eve didn't even know what a bad day was. They were in the Garden of Eden. They were having the best of days. There was no outside factor that would make them extra susceptible to temptation. That kind of thing didn't exist at that point. They were human, and there's just something in us that wants more than what God is giving us right now. And the enemy is a master at exploiting that weakness, and he never rests, and he will never stop trying to get us to follow him in his path to destruction. May we learn from the example set before us and choose the wise path. The path that was forged through obedience unto death by the one who loves us, his creation, so much that he was willing to come and die for us. And may we pursue the righteousness and holiness that is imparted to us as a gift, remembering what our Savior has done for us, and thank him for his amazing grace. Let's pray. Father God, you are so, so good to us. We thank you for knowing us so well that before we even took a breath, you knew everything we were going to do in our lives. We knew everything that was going to happen. And you just loved us so much that you gave yourself so that we did not have to be separated from you anymore. Help us to overcome the sin in our hearts and the sin in our lives. Lord, we cannot do it without you. We need your help. We cannot do it without you, and we must do it. Lord, we need you. Holy Spirit, come into our hearts. In your name, amen. Go in peace.